Please listen carefully. Hello, universe. Welcome to the Optimist Daily Update. I'm Summers McKay. And I'm Christy Jansen. And we are part of the team behind the Optimist Daily, making solutions the news. We bring you reader-funded solutions news every day in order to change the tenor of news media, social media, your neighborly interactions, and the direction of your day to help us all get focused on solutions. Seven days a week, we publish positive news stories written by award-winning journalists and delivered online to your inbox and through our social channels. And also, we are sharing the solutions in a commute-worthy, walk-worthy, home office-worthy, waiting for your toddler on the potty-worthy podcast. (laughs) Today is Thursday, the 21st of April, 2022. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day, my friend. Official Earth Day might actually be the 22nd, but I'm still celebrating a day early. Yeah. You're taking Earth Day on a little bit early. Mm-hmm. You are ready for some Earth mm-hmm. earthly celebrations. Earth, Earth Day weekend. Earth Day weekend, exactly. Well, the home that we are staying in while well, our home is being restored has this back area where um, the deer are are basically having their fawns. And so there there seem to be two deer mamas who are preparing for this to be their little space where their little fawns will be tucked away this spring. I was a bit worried that they wouldn't do it because we have this new puppy, and but it seems that Denali Sally has sort of resolved his experience with them and everybody just sort of says hi and they know he's not going to eat them. And the trees are blooming, the amount of pollen everywhere is a bit absurd, but earth is gorgeous. And I love being able to celebrate sunrises and, uh, and spring. So feeling particularly grateful, grateful about all the birds and all the things that are flying through the air. I referenced waiting on the potty with your toddler at the beginning of this intro, because really quickly, I want to talk about toilet paper. (laughs) You know, we have not let Brennan use the toilet paper roll. So we've had the toilet paper roll away from her so she couldn't just spin it all out because that's really fun, right? If you're a kitten or a toddler. But I have decided that we are going to teach her instead of taking away the opportunity to play with toilet paper, we're going to teach her good toilet paper stewardship and how to take better care of this earth. I like that. Because I figure early on, I need to teach her that it's it's something that we should you know respect. Which kind of reminds me of this new Netflix show which I don't know if you've been watching it, but it's a new hit on Netflix. I can't remember what the title is, but it's from Japan. And it's a show that's been on in Japan since the 90s. But what it is, is it shows kids between the ages of two and five doing their first errands on their own in their villages. So like it shows them with a camera crew where the little two-year-old is going to the store by herself to get a piece of candy. Oh. Or, you know, four-year-old's going to visit his grandpa. Um, who lives in the neighborhood. Okay. And um, apparently there is a tradition in Japanese parenting that it's really important to help kids feel their independence. Right, right. It's a rite of passage in that two to Mm five-year-old age group Mm -hmm. to get the kids comfortable doing chores and errands for their parents and for themselves. So I love that because that's actually part of the mindset that I'm shifting where – with Brennan, it's all kind of been prevention of mishap. And that ends up like having this sort of bubble feeling, yeah. whereas instead it's about teaching safety through navigating the world as opposed mm-hmm. to preventing world navigation. So I love this. Right. I clearly need yeah. to watch the show on Netflix. I think there's been a huge shift in American parenting trends over the last 20, 30 years. I don't know how long, but like when I was a kid, I was like, I remember walking to first grade yeah, and this was like in the city of Los Angeles with me and my little uh, cousin, you know, and we would walk right. probably 10 blocks to school in LA and we definitely had some not so great interactions with adults on the way there a couple times, but um, I would never think to let my kids to walk around in the neighborhood today. And I'm even anxious about my 16-year-old getting out there, you know? I know. So we've become much more uh, contained and overprotective, I think. And then what we end up with is like getting frustrated when our kids are, you know, growing into adulthood and they suddenly seem to like right. lack some of that autonomy that we never took the time to right. give them. So right. we have to let the little birds fly. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of little birds flying, Summers, why don't you do your story first? Yes. Let's get to the news. In my obsession with springtime and birds, bees, and bugs, I am picking a headline from our wildlife section. 
My headline reads, Why Birds Migrate So Far and How You Can Help Them. This exquisite time of year signals birth of new life, warmer weather, greener trees, and the return of migrating birds. In North America, most birds migrate to some extent, with more than 30 species traveling between climates in the U.S. and the tropics every year. The birds carry out these journeys in a truly magnificent and impressive way. One of these treks is embarked on by the Arctic tern, flying over 22,000 miles in their annual round trip from the Arctic to the Antarctic. These birds are constantly living in summer and experience more daylight than any other creature. I think that that would be my bird if I were a bird. The question is, why do birds migrate? Many centuries ago, understanding migrating birds was certainly a mystery. Some people believe that they disappeared because they fell asleep at the bottom of ponds, lakes, or even flew to the moon. But thanks to trackers and science, we now know that these (laughs) animals travel long distances to live in hotter climates during this time of year. The migration increases their chance of survival, giving them a better chance to find a mate, food, and avoid predators. Birds find their way through an internal natural GPS system, which, by the way, female elephant seals also have, and the innate ability is passed on through genetics. The cuckoo is an example of a wild bird with the ability to travel alone from Europe to Africa and back again. Now, they inherit this ability both through genetics and as well as social learning, learning the safest flying routes. Caspian fathers carry the responsibility of teaching their young correct migration patterns. All of these natural cues, shapes of coasts, the you know movement, the air, the currents, all of this help the birds, but we can help them too. If you would like to help birds as they navigate during a visit to your country, here are just a few ideas. Providing easily accessible food will help increase the chance of survival for birds in your area. You guys know me. I am a total bird nerd. Bird feeders full of seeds, nuts, and household scraps such as pastry, fruits, and cheese can provide the animals with the fuel they need. Creating a wildflower meadow or taking part in no mo may guys next month is no mo may can hugely boost the number and types of insects that will visit your yard and birds also need water so providing clean fresh water especially in urban areas where there are less natural resources will help these migrating beings i like this i think especially the no mowing for a period of time yeah. when you've got the ability to let the insects come back that could be a tremendous help tremendously helpful. I've, I read somewhere that the Audubon Society is actually asking people not to put out too much bird food and bird seed because there's an avian bird flu epidemic mm-hmm. and to keep it from getting spread to birds in the wild. Well, that makes sense in the sense of if you have a bird feeder, then many birds are coming to the same location to eat as opposed to going to lots of different locations. So the ways that yeah. you could do that is you could spread bird seed more wildly, but you could spread bird seed over larger areas. Right. You can still feed birds, but sometimes the enclosed feeders instead have big nested pots, which then the squirrels get really excited about. But you're right that having the lone bird feeder that all the birds come to can be a place of furthering disease. So it's like you need to have a little social distancing there to keep them from getting the flu. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, But that can also be managed by taking really good care of your bird feeders as well as making sure there's fresh, clean water and that things don't get really icky. And So it's true that sometimes the things we can do to help can also create harm, but overall an improved ecosystem and the no mo may definitely i know i'm going to try to push for no mo may in my neighborhood and i am actually going to go out and because it is earth day my earth day action over the weekend is that i have this great big bag of wild flower seeds that i'm going to go spread wildly all over our backyard and my husband is forbidden from mowing i don't think i'm going to convince him to not mow the front yard but i can get him to not mow the backyard for the whole month of may so Yay, bird nerds. <laughs> well, speaking of stewardship of our natural resources, my uh, headline is a little bit along those lines because it's about a local community in Gabon that succeeded in saving its ancestral forest from loggers. So this story is about a community in northeastern Gabon that about a year and a half ago embarked on a first-of-its-kind initiative to request the declassification of a logging concession 
on their ancestral forest. As part of the effort, the villagers sought instead to reclassify the forest as a protected area to safeguard its ecological and heritage values. Now, they have finally been listened to by the government of Gabon, and Gabon's environment minister recently announced a ban on commercial logging in the area. The logging concession was given to a logging company called Transport Boys Negoche International, or TBNI, but the firm had recently started intensifying the number of trees that they felled. And just after the community asked for it to turn into a protected area, they went in and were trying to take as much as they could before. So uh, after months of mixed signals from the government, the Masaha village now has finally received the positive response it was seeking. And they got the declaration that there's a ban on the commercial logging. And it only came after the environment minister himself came to visit the local community in Masaha. And his name was Lee White, but he talked with the community. He visited the abandoned sites of several ancestral villages, Mm -hmm. as well as a sacred site where the villagers performed a spiritual ceremony. By doing this, the community showed him how the logging has been affecting the ecosystem in the area and how their ancestral sites were being destroyed by all this commercial activity. Anyway, it's just like kind of this really nice story that local action really can make a difference and that we we can find our voices. And it reminds me that a lot of times it's the indigenous populations that are key in these forests and they are a part of a balanced ecosystem. And just moving the people out isn't always the answer. In the meantime, being good stewards of the forest as opposed to just cutting down all of the trees can really be the boon for conservation. This story also points out that this is a precedent that is a sort of a milestone because now the government still has to determine how to protect Mm -hmm. the forest in the best way in terms of what its legal status is going to be. But just making this decision is a milestone. The bigger one will be on what the actual conservation legal status is for Gabon. As it is, it's the first time a protected area would be established in this country at the request of a local community. So this is kind of a bottom-up story as well as a conservation story. So that's why I like it. Yeah, I I love it because it's also the policymakers took time to go visit the place and have communion with the community and Mm -hmm. understand that decisions can't be siloed. Decisions can't be made without actually knowing where you are and, and what the impacts are. Other stories that we have, NASA's plan to make space more accessible to all. Five steps for making your clothes last as long as possible. Three ways to relax to the max in nature, according to science. Should schools take on the four-day work week too? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Don't worry. This story actually talks about how they provide child care. They don't just just send send the kids kids home. home. (laughs) All right. And then Indonesia outlaws sexual abuse and forced marriage. That is great that that has been outlawed. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Optimist Daily Update. We promise to continue to share positive solution-based stories with ideas on how you can participate in this changing world and ensure it is changed for the good. If you haven't already, consider becoming an emissary on theoptimistdaily.com. Also support us by sharing us on social, forwarding stories to friends, and make sure to leave positive reviews for our podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to our pod. Yep, you can be a part of the solution-changing consciousness that addresses our world's biggest challenges with that problem-solving mindset and help us keep the Optimus Daily free for everyone who needs it, supported by those of us who can. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We'll be back tomorrow with more solutions.